I've received this box today and it contains something absolutely amazing. So let's have a look together and see what's inside. Hello, the internet, and welcome back to my channel. So the other day, I was watching this video of Apictronics, which you find uh, linked down below, about an IBM PS2 Model 30. And um, I got quite interested in that because uh, when I was a teenager, my school had two laboratories with those machines. There were a number of Model 30s, and I think it was one Model 50, which is a 286. Now, as you might imagine, you know, as a, say, 15, 14, 15 years old, you know, those computers, the noise they were making, that was my first experience with MS-DOS. I have to say, Epictronics video brought back quite a lot of memories. A very, in a very impulsive way, I went to an eBay and I looked for a IBM PS2 Model 30, which is the 8086. And with my surprise, I found one nearby at a reasonable price, I feel, which is more or less working as usual, because otherwise, where's the fun? So yes, this box should contain an IBM PS2 Model 30. Now I have buckets of projects which have been in the pipeline forever, and this was not supposed to have priority, but I've decided I couldn't wait to open this box and see its content and check it out. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to open this box, we'll have a look together at the state of the machine, maybe we'll power it up, see what the problem is, and then I'll make another video later on, maybe next, probably next year, to uh, fix the machine, assuming it needs some, some fixing. So let's crack on and open this box. Well, let me say I'm incredibly impressed by the eBay seller. It's a box into a box with, how would you call this, like the peanuts. So well done, eBay seller. As some of you might know, might have experienced, it's not easy to get this good packaging. Um, I honestly don't think I've ever seen something packaged so well. Isn't that... A beauty. It brings up so many memories. I'm absolutely amazed. The state of this thing looks great. I mean, aesthetically, the plastic looks in great condition. Let's have a look on the sides. You got some wear and tear scratches, but that's totally fine. There is a little bit of rust on some metal parts. Like you can see on this, this is some kind of add-on board. You can see there is a little bit of rust. That's not a big deal for the time being. Again, as long as I don't find that on the motherboard, that's totally fine. Manufactured by International Business Machines Corporation, New York. And this is a PS2 Type 8530. There's a little bit of rust on the fan grill here, but overall, again, even the back cover, it's in good shape. There's still, I don't see anything broken, which is the most important part. And I don't see anything that can be restored with maybe a little bit of paint and definitely a good scrub. Right hand side is more or less perfect. And the bottom case, which is in shiny metal, is mildly rusted. There is a little bit of rust, not too much, which I guess is a good sign. I have all four feet and I don't see anything major here. Now, I do see some corrosion inside the floppy disk, which is not great. I was aware of that, so it's not really a surprise. And again, hopefully that's the extent of the corrosion. It doesn't go anywhere else. And it looks like this computer belonged to this uh, LFCDA, which if I'm, again, I'm just Googled it. I'm not sure whether that is the same thing, but apparently that used to be, well, it is the London Fire and Civil Defense Authority in London, obviously. And this comes from London. So I would say that's probably where it comes from. I kind of feel I don't want to remove this thing now. You know, it's just, I feel it's part of the computer itself. What do you think about that? Can you leave a comment down below? Well, I guess before I power up the computer, I'd like to take a, definitely take a look inside and I might want to take a look inside the power supply, make sure there's no refuse that could explode and, you know, just make sure there's nothing massively wrong. I just don't feel like just plug it up and see what happens. So if I watched uh, Epictronics videos correctly, uh, I think all I need to do is just to undo the screws here. Oh, look at this beauty. 
And look at this beauty. This is the first time I'm opening one of these machines. I've only been using this as, as a teenager. So we have here an IBM hard drive, which is model WDI325Q. And Google says this is a 20 megabyte hard drive. And this is amazing because the computers I used to use when I was a kid at my school were 20 megabytes. So this is like, it's probably one of those machines. Then we have an IBM floppy drive, of course. There is obviously, as expected, some corrosion on the chassis, but you know, that's not a big deal. It just needs to be removed. Uh, scraped the, the rust away and repainted. I see corrosion on the power supply. Again, nothing horrendous, but definitely something that maybe needs to be taken care of. And the motherboard, to be honest, looks more dirty than corroded. I mean, it's definitely not in the best shape, but I don't see rust on the motherboard and I don't see a massive amount of corrosion. I see age, to be honest with you. So hopefully that's a good thing. It definitely needs a good clean. I do see some minor corrosions on, like for example, I guess this is a, a quartz for the clock. But again, if you look at the chips and the legs and everything, I don't really see anything major. Definitely, this is not the best motherboard in terms of shape, but obviously, you know, it came at a reasonable price and I feel that this is probably very acceptable. Now, this PS2, they used to come with this Panasonic batteries. And surprisingly, I've been Googling around and they seldom leak. So I don't see any leakage coming out from the battery. I do see a little bit of rust on the, uh, at the back, but nothing really serious. And hopefully it's, it's just a matter of replacing it and, and the computer is gonna be happy. Now, out of curiosity, shall we take a reading on this battery and see if by any chance there's anything coming out of it? We got 0.35 volts. So clearly the battery needs to be replaced as expected, of course. Now, considering the shape of this machine, I don't really feel comfortable in just, you know, flipping the power switch, which is amazing, by the way, I'll show you in a minute. So I think the least I can do, I'd like to remove the power supply, open it up, make sure there's nothing is horribly wrong. And maybe what I can do, I can test the voltages without the motherboard connected and see what happens. Now I'm aware those power supplies, the old power supplies, they might not like being powered without a load. What I can do, I can uh, fit like a small resistor just to simulate a small load on the outputs and then measure the voltages out of it and see what happens. Some of you might be familiar with this. This is the power switch. The power switch is actually on the power supply. But basically to have a power switch at the front of the unit rather than out the back, where it would have been, let's say, reasonable to have a power supply switch, they installed this little rod that goes to the front. So when you power up, oh my gosh. <laughs> it, this is like the definition of over-engineering. This whole case is over-engineered. I mean, it's properly engineered, let's put it that way. I mean, they don't do these things anymore, but it, it's a beauty to see. It's just so satisfying to do this. In order to remove the power supply, I will have to remove the back cover, which is held in place by these little plastic clips. Uh, I can feel they are still pretty flexible, so hopefully I'm not gonna break them. Now, one feature of these IBM PS2 machines is that the hard drive and the floppy drive, they all get powered through these ribbon cables, these flat cables. So all it goes to the motherboard are these two connectors, which I'm not entirely sure they are the standard AT connectors. I'll check in a minute, but I believe they are. So here we got the power supply, which is an IBM part number 61X8574. It's a plus five, minus five, plus 12, minus 12 power supply as expected. And it's a 70 watts unit. Now this power supply is featuring these Torx safety security screws or whatever. And being an IBM old machine and an IBM power supply particularly, I have this special tool here, which is an official IBM power supply screw remover, which I'm going to use to remove my screw. Well, sorry? What? Oh, oh there's, there's an updated version. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, okay, that's an updated version. So, okay, sorry, so that's not up to date anymore. I'm told that I can use one of my bits here and apparently, I don't know, I feel it's the same thing to be honest, but hey, look at that, it works. 
So as expected, there's a little bit of rust inside. There's a small spider as well. No, I don't, actually don't think it's in a bad shape. It's, it's just a combination of dirt and there's a little bit of rust on this metal piece here. But if I'm looking at the PCB and all the components, I would say that this is probably not in bad shape. Again, it, I think this is more dirt than corrosion or anything, which is totally expected. Let me blow this with my air compressor and let's see what we can see after that. Because so far, it doesn't look too bad. Again, the chassis, you can see, it's a bit corroded. We know about that. And I guess that could be part of the restoration. Just remove the rust, repaint everything. And I think I'm in luck with when it comes to refuzz, because I think that is the filter capacitor, but it's not a reefer. There's another one here. Well, that looks to be an F1772 from the internet. The F11, sorry, F1772 is uh, an X2 interference suppressor film capacitor. So I think we're in a good place. Let me uh, clean this thing from dust and then uh, I guess we can try and power it up. It's a bit unclear on the internet whether this power supply is able to work without a load. Now, I don't think it will just self-destruct itself if I'm running without a load, but just to be on the safe side, I've got here a couple of resistors. One is 75 ohms, one is 4.8 ohms. I'm going to plug the 12, plus 12 and plus 5, which look like are the, the ones with the highest current available. I have a feeling these are the, like the driving voltages, the other are probably derived from them, but I might be saying rubbish here. Anyways, the 12 volts will be driven at 0.16 amps. I really haven't got anything better than that. The 5 volts is going to be driven at 1 amp. They both can do more than that, so that should be totally fine. And I have checked for shorts in between ground and all the rails, and I don't have a dead short. So let me plug the resistors, and then I'll plug these into my current limiter just to be on the safe side. It's also an isolation transformer for safety. We'll power it up and see what happens. Yes, I do know that this looks like uh, some sort of flux capacitor. <laughs> well, I've never shown this on video. I will make a video for this. This is my isolation transformer and current limiter. So I have a safety and isolation transformer here, and I have a number of light bulbs which I can select using the switches to basically limit the power to different currents without having to basically change the bulb. So three, two, one, go. Yeah, I've got the fan and we've got 11.1 volts. Let's give it a bit more juice. There you go. 12 volts is okay. It's kind of a low side, but I guess it's fine. There are a couple of adjust them, adjustments inside, so maybe I'll check on the service manual and... Wait a minute. Do I see the smoke? Oh yeah. You didn't see it. Uh, it's fine. I saw a little bit of smoke, but that's actually my resistor. I completely forgot. Yeah, obviously I'm feeding one amp at five volts and obviously the resistor is not capable of doing five amps. So the resistor was burning. So let's remove the five volt resistor. Right, let's go on and I'll check all the other voltages using my multimeter. Three, two, one, go. 5.18, totally fine. This should be the minus five. Yeah, minus 4.8. This is power good, I think, which is high. I'm assuming it's good. There you go, 11.66. Voltages are a bit, probably could be better, especially 12 volts is kind of the low side. But again, I see a couple of trimmers inside and hopefully this can be adjusted. Uh, the fan is also working, so happy days, but I feel confident now I can plug it back into the computer in the PS2 and, and see what works and what doesn't. Now, the PS2 Model 30, the 8086 Model 30, doesn't come with VGA output. It comes with uh, MCGA, which is uh, basically using a subset of the VGA standard. Now, later models, they do come with VGA, but as you notice here, the 15 pin connector at the back of the unit is missing one of the pin, which is pin nine, which is basically the five volts DCC power, which is powering an EEPROM in the monitor to basically tell the PC what type of monitor it is, the resolution supported, blah, blah, blah. Now this is way before plug and play happened. So IBM didn't punch a hole on pin nine. So when I went to plug my VGA cable here, I hit the snug because obviously that doesn't fit. I understand from the internet you can either punch a hole in here, which I really, it's an idea I don't like, or you grab one of your VGA cables and what you're doing, you, you can just remove one of the pins, but obviously then you're gonna lose the plug and play capability when you're using the cable on a newer monitor. To be honest, I was about to get one of my cables and just remove pin number nine, and then looking at my box of cables, 
I surprisingly found one of these VGA cables which is missing pin number 9, so happy days I guess. Now the name PS2 stands for Personal System 2, but it also happens to introduce the PS2 connectors and obviously as keyboard as much as I'd like the clackety clackety keyboard that came with these machines but they would be more expensive than the machine itself so for now I think I'm gonna use my PS2 keyboard here the system is now plugged into a monitor I've got a keyboard connected I'm about to power it up I've also connected my multimeter to the 5 volts so I want to just quickly check what happens to the 5 volt rail when uh, when the system is uh, under load I will place the microphone close to the unit so you can hear the noise that it makes when it powers up and, uh, and we'll see what happens. Well, the hard drive is making an unhealthy noise. I have this. Well, first of all, I'm reading 128 kilobyte of RAM, which feels a bit wrong for the system. I thought this system came with 640 kilobytes from the factory. Uh, then we have a memory error. Oh, well, obviously we have a memory error, so uh, probably something we need to look at. Uh, date and time, obviously error 161, that's just the battery is gone. We also have a 1701, which sounds very much like Star Trek, fixed disk error. And considering the noise I heard from the disk, it's probably not a good thing. But let's try and press F1 and see what happens. Well, we do have a response and it's trying to load which is good. I would say the next step would be to try and get an MS-DOS disk and also I uh, think it's called the reference diskette because this thing doesn't have a BIOS or the BIOS is accessible through a software which comes on a disk. Now one issue I have with this is that I think the floppy drive is not 1.44 megabyte but it's only 720. The disks are basically the same so I, I think I just need to cover one of the holes on the side but all my MS-DOS diskettes they are actually 1.44. Well, I found an issue here. This doesn't go in. It looks like there's something inside, something kind of soft. So I'll have to inspect this one. And I heard about this. I think it's on uh, Epictronics video. There's this little thing with some um, foam attached to it and it falls on every single one of this. Oh, there it is. That's easy. Before assuming that the hard drive is completely dead, which is unfortunately, it's gonna be, be quite possible. Uh, let me just reseat this cable and see if that changes anything. Let me put some uh, contact cleaner, let me clean that connector as well and, and see if by any chance that changes anything. Time to try again, but I have not much hope to be honest. There's definitely a mechanical issue with the drive because I can hear the head trying to move or doing something. So I will look online to see by any chance there's a fix for that. But unfortunately, it looks like the hard drive is not working. Now, the system has ISA slots. I can fit a hard drive controller and, um, and just use a normal hard drive, but I really would like to have one of these, even though I have a feeling that even if I buy something online, it's going to be probably like a ticking bomb and just waiting to, to die uh, at some point. But for now, again, this is just a presentation video, so for now we know the hard drive, unfortunately, is not working. And I had completely forgotten that the IBM comes with BASIC on board. So by just pressing F1 with no diskette in it, the PS2 boots into BASIC. So I guess it's a, it's a must, right? Yeah. Now what you see here is the hard drive, it's on a side, as I was trying to take a look. Now how cute is this thing that has actually a moving part inside? I'm powering up now. <laughs> it's so quaint. Okay, I've been uh, spending quite a few hours uh, trying to create a disk that works in the PS2. I believe this is a 720K drive. I've tried creating a 720K drive and it wouldn't work. So I assumed it was, you know, Windows 10 is not really happy with, with the 720K. Well, eventually I got out my Pentium motherboard. That's an actual drive. 
And I ended up with a command line MS-DOS software, which is right in the image I found online. And it still doesn't read it. So I now feel that maybe that this drive is not working either, which is kind of a bummer. I guess, I don't really want to do much on this video, but at least try to boot MS-DOS. It's, it's DOS Semba, so I'd like to boot MS-DOS. So maybe I can open it up and try at least and clean the heads. Maybe that's all it needs and reset the, the cables. Maybe that's all it takes, to be honest, because so far I haven't got any luck in doing much with this computer. Okay, let's take a look at this floppy drive. Hopefully it's something simple. This is the main PCB of the floppy drive and I can see where the fallen pad is coming from. I wonder whether the metal of the pad has something to do with shielding as the electrical signals of a floppy, floppy head are very low and that cover might be required. Anyways, from here I can access the heads so I can give them a clean and I think I will reseat all the connectors and use some dry contact cleaner as well. This is the head connector and then we have some others connector on the other end of the PCB. I see cable going to the spindle motor and the head stepper. I did check the stepper coils with my multimeter and I see a resistance, so the stepper motor should be okay. Now this drive is not in the best shape as we know unfortunately. I will use some compressed air to try and get rid of the dirt. I do recommend that you don't use compressed air coming from an air compressor in these cases, as it normally contains moisture and oil, which you can't see, but it's there. Here, I'm going to use some canned air. Okay, let's try this again. Let's power up now. Well, the, the head barely moves, but then that's it. I don't see anything else and the drive still doesn't work. Could the head stepper just be jammed? Let's open it up again and let's check that out. Right, I thought this plastic screw at the back of the stepper was connected to the spindle. But no, it loosened with a crack. <laughs> but thankfully, I think I just broke the factory seal. This seems to be the bit which applies the right pressure to the spindle so to remove any mechanical play. So I will have to readjust it at some point. Okay, I can turn the spindle with my finger, so it doesn't seem to be jammed. Let me put some lubricant on the gear and tracks, and hopefully I can fully and properly service this drive once I have it working again. What I'm gonna do now, I'll manually move the head halfway through its moving range, so I can see if it goes back to track zero when I power up the computer again. Now, let me reassemble the drive and test again. And it does move, but then it doesn't move any further. That's pretty weird. I had a look online. These drives apparently are known for failing. Some recommend replacing the capacitors. I guess this will be part of the repair video once I pick up this project again. For now, well, well the floppy drive is not working. Off camera, I took a look at the hard drive as well, but I had no luck. I removed the PCB and there was quite a lot of dirt. I gave it a clean and reseated and cleaned all the connectors. Unfortunately, I found quite a lot of corrosion on the flat cable which connects to the head. If those traces are broken, it might be an issue which I'm not sure can be fixed. The platters are spinning though, so hopefully it's just a jammed head stepper. On my next video on this computer, I'd like to try and access that stepper motor because I see a cover with a screw which might lead to the spindle. I'm not super optimistic, but I haven't given up on these drives yet. Well, I was hoping to show you a bit more on this machine. I was hoping to run MS-DOS on it for DOS Semba, but it looks like this machine needs a little bit of more attention than I thought. I'm not entirely sure whether the floppy disk is not working or maybe the memory issue, the, uh, which I've been ignoring, is preventing the floppy routine from working properly. And maybe I'm chasing ghosts here. Uh, I do not know. I don't have another machine to test. I don't have another floppy. As I said at the beginning, I wanted this video to be like a quick overview view of the machine and see what's wrong with it. I would like now to store the machine and go on with some other projects which have been in the pipeline for a long time. So I appreciate this is not much, but this is my contribution for December. Uh, we got some sort of MS-DOS running, so hopefully that's enough. And I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, as usual, I would appreciate a little 
thumbs up uh, down below and uh, hopefully you will consider subscribing to my channel if you like what I'm doing. For now, as usual, I wish you a great day and I hope I'll see you soon here on my channel for my next video. Goodbye. Thank you.